It's 1996 and the internet is going to end. It's doomed, we're out of IP addresses, there's nothing we can do. But then in comes in RFC 1918, an unlikely hero that literally saved the day. Without it, we would not have the internet we have. You wouldn't be watching me right now. And my toilet could not be connected to the internet. Which I think is, I don't know, a bad thing? But seriously, we're talking about two things in this video, private IP addresses and NAT. Without these two things, we would be nowhere. And they literally changed the game of the entire internet, the entire world. So get your coffee ready. Let's jump into this. Whoa, 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 hold up. Before we dive in, I gotta tell you, not only do you suck at subnetting, you also probably suck at password security, which means you're gonna get hacked, like any day now, any moment now, like now. You should check your passwords. You just got hacked. See, I told you. But if you're using a password manager like Dashlane, then you're probably okay. Dashlane is a sponsor of this video and I am legit a customer. I use them personally for all my passwords and more importantly, I use them in my business to protect me from my employees because they're not the most tech savvy in the world and would use password one, two, three for everything if I let them. Is that you? Don't do that, you know who you are. But with Dashlane, I can force them to be secure with different and complex passwords for every website. And my absolute favorite feature of Dashlane, two-factor authentication right here in the stinking browser. I seriously use that all the time, it's probably my favorite feature. And I can even share a password with my assistant and it will also share the two-factor authentication. It's secure and it's, like I don't know anything else that does that well. And Dashlane is more than passwords. I actually store my credit cards securely in Dashlane. And when I'm shopping for, you know, like Raspberry Pis, when they actually come in stock, I can quickly buy them with the card fill-in thing. It's awesome. You can also store personal info and secure notes and secrets. It's like a chamber of secrets. It's the chamber of secrets. And probably the best feature they have is dark web monitoring. The dark web is a scary place and guess what? Your password and your email are probably for sale on it right now. Legit, a hacker can go out there and buy your password. But with Dashlane, they monitor the dark web. They monitor all the dark, scary places, the places you'll never wanna go by yourself, and they will alert you if they find your email or password, or both. So if you are not using a password manager like Dashlane, Please use it, I'm begging you. As a security person, I'm just begging you please use one. And I can highly recommend Dashlane as a personal user and a business user. So check them out, link below, dashlane.com forward slash network chuck 50. You'll get it free on your first device because you can use it on pretty much anything, your phone, your computer, your toilet. No, just kidding, but maybe someday. And if you want to go premium, you can use code network chuck 50 and get 50% off. Just do it, you need to be secure. Please, if you take away anything from this video, please just secure your passwords. I care about your security. Anyways, now I feel safe enough to dive into the video. Let's do this. Welcome back to our You Suck at Subnetting series where I wanna teach you how to become a Master Chief Ninja Subnetting Master something. You're gonna become really good at subnetting. That's what I'm talking about. In the last few episodes, we covered, hey, what's an IP address? And hey, we only have 4.3 billion of them about. And hey, <laughs> the designers of the internet organized them terribly, and now we're almost out of IP addresses. Actually, we are out of IP addresses. But we did something. RFC 1918. Let's talk about it. RFC 1918 was the internet's giant band-aid. And the band-aid was private IP addresses. Now, so far, we've focused on these guys right here. What we'll refer to now as public IP addresses or basically IP addresses that can be reached on the internet. Which when you think about the internet, I want you to think about it as just a big network. Just a bunch of devices all connected together. And everything that wants to talk on that big network needs an IP address, a public IP address. So you, sitting there on your computer, you do need a public IP address to watch this video. Or maybe on your phone, whatever. You still need a public IP address to interface with the internet. But it has to be unique. So if you have 128.1.4.43, David Bomble down here cannot have that same IP address. They have to be unique. It'd be like us having the same cell phone number. You try to call it and we both get the ring. It just, it just wouldn't work, right? You can't both have the same cell phone number and you can't both have the same public IP address. But going back to our problem, there aren't enough IP addresses to give everyone and every device a public IP address. If I just think about all the devices in my house, I know I at least have, and I'm probably being conservative, 70 or so devices with an IP address. No, no, I've got more than that. Over 200 devices in my home have an IP address. And if every home was like me, that'd be crazy. So the powers that be created private IP addresses. And actually what they did is they took a few chunks out of our public IP address ranges and just said, hey, these are private now. You can't use them anymore. <laughs> That's legit what they did. So check this out. They did an IP address transplant out of each of these classes, A, B, and C. Took a nice little chunk and said, bam, private IP addresses. And just like their classical counterparts, they have the same default subnet mask. And look at this, you might've caught this. That class C IP address range, 
might look kind of familiar, right? And that's how I knew it was your home network because the most common private IP address range that routers use, home routers, is 192.168, a class C IP address range. So your home network, 192.168.1.0 with this subnet mask, I knew you had it because well, everyone has it, which means that private IP addresses by nature are not unique, contrary to their public IP address counterparts, which hey, solves our problem because man, if I can have the same network as you and David Bomble and my brother Cameron, then we don't have a problem anymore. We can all share the same IP addresses, right? Well, no, we still have one problem. These private IP addresses will not connect you to the internet. And that's the big difference between public and private. Private IP addresses, those ranges, are not publicly routable on the internet, which means you can't talk to them from the internet. So right now with your computer, it has a private IP address. Check, do the IP config thing we did in the first episode. You have a private IP and you can't access the internet. You just can't. <laughs> Which you're probably thinking, well, Chuck, you're wrong. I'm watching you right now. I know. And you're right. To solve that pesky internet problem is the other half of the Band-Aid. It's a magical thing that changed the game completely. It's called NAT, or Network Address Translation. So what's cool is that right now in your home network, NAT is doing its thing. NAT is working its magic, and here's what's happening right now. So look at your home network. This is it right, right here, right? You've got a smart toilet. I know you do. Don't lie to me. Here in your home network, it would be impossible to assign every device you have a public IP address. It just wouldn't work. There's not enough for everyone. So instead, we have Oprah, your router, give out private IP addresses. IP addresses that are not unique, millions of people can have the same IP address, and it totally works. But if you wanted to go out to networkchuck.coffee, which lives on a server in the cloud somewhere, I'm not gonna tell you where it is, you just couldn't do it. You wouldn't make it past your own little private home network because networkchuck.coffee is on a server on the internet with a public IP address. And this IP address for my server is totally unique. So here's the magic. In comes Mr. Nat. Actually first, your ISP, your internet service provider. Mine, for example, is AT&T. You say, hey, AT&T, I want my home to connect to the internet. And they say, okay, here is one public IP address and you can borrow it. We'll let you borrow it, but just one. And you're thinking, holy crap, I have like 300 devices I have to connect. That's not enough. And I'll tell you, yes it is. With NAT, it's more than enough. Check it out. AT&T being the bigger Oprah will assign your littler Oprah, your router, a public IP address. I'll just pick one randomly. Let's say 11.5.4.28. So what NAT will do, and by the way, NAT is being performed by Oprah, your router. I know, she does it all, doesn't she? Your router is doing the NAT, the network address translation. So, whenever your smart toilet wants to go out to networkchuck.coffee, it, with its private IP address, will go, hey, Oprah, can I go to networkchuck.coffee? She'll say, yes, I'll take care of it for you, and then she'll send a message to networkchuck.coffee, and everything's totally cool because she can communicate with my server because she has a public IP address of this guy right here. NAT will auto-magically translate that private IP address into a public one when it leaves your router. And your router, Oprah, is actually doing it. So what that means is that not just your toilet has that public IP address, but literally every device on your home network, when it accesses anything from Netflix to YouTube, it doesn't matter, their identity is one identity. That one public IP address your ISP gave you. So do you see how that kind of saved the day with our internet woes? Instead of every device in our home networks having a public IP address, so no, 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 we're not doing that, that's crazy. Let's give them private IP addresses and then we'll get the, give them just one public IP. Now I want you to do something fun real quick because right now you do have a public IP address, just one public IP in your house. If you open up your web browser, <laughs> I Googled David Bumble's face earlier, and you go to Google, and I'm gonna hide mine, but if you type in what is my IP address into Google, it'll tell you. That's your one public IP. Because as you're accessing Google, your computer or your phone or your tablet, whatever it is, Google sees you as that one public IP. But again, if you launch your command prompt and you type in IP config, your computer or your device's IP address is not that public one. It's a private one, like mine right here, 192.168.1. Dot two zero four, a public, or I'm sorry, a private IP address. Isn't that cool? Man, it's amazing. Now adding one more thing to that, it's even cooler, is when that website wants to send something back to your toilet when it talks to networkchuck.coffee. So let's say for example, my toilet's like, hey, I wanna see some pictures of coffee. So we send that request to the server saying, hey, show us some pictures of coffee. When networkchuck.coffee, the server, sends those pictures back, Oprah will automatically know, oh, oh man, this picture is for 
toilet over here, <laughs> 192.168.1.25, and forward it right on through. The process in that is much more complex than I'm describing here, and we'll dive deeper into that in my CCNA series, but man, is that stinking cool or what? And this right here, literally save the internet, and it's how nearly every network you can think of works, from everyone's home network, millions of people, and businesses, all the big businesses, they use private IP addresses in their business. All their devices have private IP addresses, and then they have public IP addresses using that. Isn't that cool? Man. Now, I do have some bad news. <laughs> Even with private IP addressing, and using NAT, it didn't solve our problem, because we still did run out of IPv4 addresses. And now you notice I said something weird this time. I said IPv4. What? What are you talking about, Chuck? Yeah. Okay, check this out. In this series, we are laser focusing on IPv4 addresses. You may remember earlier on, I said, hey, ignore that V4. Pay attention real quick and then ignore it again. IPv4 is the typical four numbers separated by three dots. But, you know, we ran out, even with our awesome band-aids. So up came this amazing thing called IPv6. It's so amazing that we skipped five. It's like the iPhone 10, man. And here's what an IPv6 address looks like. Dude, it's freaking nuts. It's got numbers, it's got letters, it's got extra dots on top of the other dots, colons, but it's, it's crazy and it's obviously much bigger. This right here does solve our problems for the time being, as far as we can look into the future. I'm afraid we might make the same mistakes. Now the amount of IPv6 addresses that are possible is kind of insane. It's two, to the 128th power, which if you recall from IPv4, that was two to the 32nd power. Second power, I, I don't know why I can't say that. So it's a lot bigger, so big that literally every device we have could get an IPv6 public address and connect to the internet. And we'd have plenty left over. And also you may have wondered like, hey, what about my cell phone? Because everyone pretty much has a cell phone now, right? I don't know why this cell phone's so fat. It's like a picture frame, I'm sorry. Let me label it. So you have a cell phone and when you're walking around, not at your home network, not connected to Wi-Fi, you're connected to your cellular provider. And guess what? Your phone has a public IP address. So everyone who has a phone who's walking around has a public IP address. And I'm willing to bet more often than not, your phone has a public IPv6 address. Many of the carriers out there from AT&T to Bell to, Orange, all of them out there, they're using IPv6. And yeah, that means the industry, the internet is shifting over to IPv6. Now, sure, plenty of websites and most of them I would imagine right now still use IPv4. IPv4 is going nowhere. So yes, you still need to learn it. Hopefully what you're learning here will still be valuable for at least the next 50 years, I'm calling it. But that does also mean that you will need to learn eventually IPv6. And in the course of my CCNA series, I am gonna cover IPv6. And yeah, I'm not gonna lie. The sucker looks scary, but don't worry, we'll take care of it later. That's that's for that's for future use problem, right? Whew, man, take yourself a coffee break. This was a lot. So not only do we have different classes of IP addresses, A, B, C, D, and E, but also we have public and then private IP addresses. Public being the IP addresses that are routable on the internet. If you wanna to connect to the internet, you gotta have one of those guys. But then we have private IP addresses, addresses that are not unique, that most home network devices have and they saved the internet. So your device right now, you're watching me on, has a private IP address. And with the magic of NAT, you can connect to the internet and watch this video. It's really crazy, really fascinating, and by the way, if you wanna dive deeper into all that, we're gonna go deeper into that. But for now, in this series, we're gonna be laser focused, coming up on IPv4 addresses and subnetting. Again, as I've mentioned before, it's a crazy, crazy valuable skill that you will need and you'll need it for pretty much every discipline in IT. So buckle your seatbelt and uh, just, dude, just take one more sip of coffee. And also make sure, and I don't know if you have, but have you hacked the YouTube algorithm today? Let's make sure you do. Hit that like button, notification bell, comment, subscribe. We gotta hack YouTube today, ethically, of course. Now real quick before you leave, are you working on your CCNA or maybe your CCNP, Security Plus, or really any IT certification? Are you working on something like that? If you are, you need Boson Software. Like I'm not kidding, they are the Industry standard, the gold standard. Does I say gold? Gold standard for practice exams and lab software. Like seriously, they are what I use to prepare for my exams. I I relied on them like that. They were my everything when I was studying for my CCMP. So if you're wondering, hey man, am I ready for that exam? Am I ready to take the Security Plus? Am I ready to take the CCNA? If you're like just because like those exams are expensive, right? So if you're wondering, Boson will pretty much tell you if you can pass their exams. 
you can pass the real exam. In fact, I think boson stuff is actually harder. That's what everyone says. And I kind of agree, it's pretty stinking hard, but it gets you ready and they're amazing. So from courseware to practice exams to practice labs, they have you covered getting you ready for that exam and also just learning IT stuff. They're great at it. So check them out, link below. Yeah, that's all I have. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. <laughs>